I know it's been a while, but here we are once again with a brand new installment of How Madden Fails to Simulate Football. This time, we're going to change pace a little bit for an episode, or two, or maybe even three. Previously, I focused on the rules of the game and on on-field gameplay, and how Madden just doesn't get those right. This time, I'm going to go off of the field and start talking about team building and coaching strategies, which are key to creating an engaging franchise mode experience. The topic of this episode is something that was voted upon by my patrons. If you would like to have voting power to influence the content that I create, then I encourage you to support the channel through Patreon. Patron support helps to offset the cost of the server of my blog, the license for the software that I use to edit these videos, and any research material that I buy. It has also allowed me to avoid monetizing these videos so that I can keep them ad-free, or at least as ad-free as they can be on a platform that will force ads into content without the creator's knowledge or consent. I know there are ads in some of my videos, but I assure you, I didn't put them there, I'm not getting any money from them, YouTube put them there, usually because someone flags some copywritten material in my video somewhere. In any case, the COVID years have been hard on a lot of people, and many of my patrons had to discontinue their support due to financial hardships. So I want to take a moment to wish all my former patrons the best. I hope that 2022 treated you better, and that 2023 will be even better yet. I'd also like to thank my current patrons and those who stuck with me. To all my patrons, past, present, and future, thank you for your support. It really does make a difference. Now let's talk football. I'm writing and editing this video in the month or two leading up to the 2023 NFL Draft, so this topic will actually, hopefully, be kind of relevant at the time that this video releases, which should be sometime around the draft. One of the ways that Madden is most different from real-life football is that in Madden, the exact skill level of every single player in the league is known to everybody all of the time. Because of the way that Madden implements player attributes and progression and also regression, users don't have to evaluate player talent at all, ever. In the vast majority of cases, ordering your depth chart is just a simple matter of sorting the players by their overall ratings. And if it's not the overall rating, then usually it's a single other attribute rating that determines who starts and who doesn't. Usually it's speed. For example, I personally favor kick and punt returners with higher speed, and usually put my fastest reserve player as my starting returner. At least on kickoffs, I might go with like a better catching returner for punts so that he doesn't fumble, uh, assuming that that particular iteration of Madden even supports muffing punt returns, which isn't even a case on a year-to-year -year basis. But anyway, yes, there are some edge cases where a user gets to make judgment calls about which player better fits your particular playstyle. But for the most part, it's all about that overall rating, and there are virtually no actual decisions to be made. This means that there is no mystery or question about which player or players are actually good, which players aren't so good, and which players might be outright busts. It also means that Madden doesn't have true position battles. One player is objectively better than the other in the vast, overwhelming majority of cases, even if it is just marginally so. It means that there's no question whether a free agent or trade will be an upgrade over the players already on your roster. It means that there isn't much value in testing out rookies in the preseason because you already know exactly how good those players are and whether they are deserving of a starting position or roster spot based on their overall ratings. All of the intrigue and what-ifs that go into roster movements and decisions in the NFL front offices are simply non-existent in Madden because so much of the game is based on these absolute numeric ratings that are completely open and transparent to everybody. Just think of some of the big questions from early in the 2022 season. Is Mitchell Trubisky better than the rookie Kenny Pickett? Should Devin Singletary get more carries than James Cook? How about Tony Pollard or Ezekiel Elliott? Should the Packers look to Alan Lazard or Sammy Watkins to replace the lost productivity of Devontae Adams? Will N'Kobe Dean play well enough as a rookie linebacker for the Eagles, or should they stick with their veteran starter from last year? Is Bailey Zappi better than Mac Jones? Is Trey Lance better than Jimmy Garoppolo? And hell, who would have thought that Brock Purdy, the dead last selection in the 2022 draft, would turn out to look so good? 
I can tell you that based on the rating he was given in the original preseason rosters, the rating adjusters at EA and Tiburon sure as heck didn't see that coming. When the 49ers lost both Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo to injury, they were left with a decision to either play their third string rookie Mr. Irrelevant or go look for a veteran free agent. There were certainly some available. They chose to gamble on Purdy, but in Madden, this is no gamble at all. Just look at Brock Purdy's ratings, and that will tell you if you need a veteran free agent or not. As for the other questions I posed, when we look at the ratings, we see that Trubisky's overall rating is 69, and Pickett's is a 68. Trubisky is better. As for Sammy Watkins and Alan Lazard, Watkins is a 79. Lazard is a 77. Watkins is better. And those are the ones that are close. The rest of these questions in Madden's roster, they're not even close. Devin Singletary is an 81. Rookie James Cook is a 76. That's a five-point difference. Ezekiel Elliott, an 88. Tony Pollard, an 81. Ezekiel's better by seven points. Rookie N'Kobe Dean is a 71. TJ Edwards, a 79. The veteran Edwards is better by a whopping eight points. As for Mac Jones, he's a respectable 78 while Bailey Zappi is all the way down at being a 63. That's a 15-point difference. No Madden player is even considering starting Bailey Zappi over Mac Jones. Not even close. As for the 49ers quarterback situation, Garoppolo is a good 5 points better than Trey Lance, and poor Brock Purdy is only a 59 overall, making him almost 20 points worse than Jimmy Garoppolo. And hell, Tom Brady was a 6th round draft pick, who, if not for an injury to Drew Bledsoe, might never have been anything more than a journeyman backup. (sighs) If only. Now, to its credit, because I firmly believe in giving credit where credit is due, Madden does try to provide some optional tools for customizing the user's experience, and some of them can actually be used to mitigate some of these roster and depth chart absolutism problems. For example, I like to set my fatigue and injury settings higher than the default in my franchise mode, and I also raise the auto-sub threshold for many positions. This adds some value to rotational reserves in situational positions like third down running back, pass rushers, or sub linebackers, because the starting running back, defensive linemen, or linebackers will be more likely to be fatigued when these situations come up, and so might not be playing to their fullest potential. This creates some extra wiggle room for assigning players to these situational positions who aren't the base starters. But this only goes so far, and CPU teams don't really have very sound substitution logic or strategies. They just put the best player at the top of the depth chart at every position, and only sub them out if they are actually below the auto-sub-fatigue threshold. And honestly, I'm not sure if the CPU teams use the same substitution thresholds as the user team, so they might get substituted out even less frequently than mine do. This complete transparency of player attributes in Madden has traditionally had the effect of making the offseason feel largely uninteresting, and the preseason is almost completely pointless. Madden users don't use the preseason in the same way that a real NFL coach might use the preseason, which is usually threefold. One, to shake out any rust in the veteran starters. Two, to determine how good their rookies, trades, and free acquisitions fit into their scheme. And three, to develop those younger players' skills with some actual full-speed game experience against a real opponent. Only that third bit is really relevant to Madden, since the other two reasons for the existence of preseason are rendered moot by the fact that Madden just tells the user how good each player is, and in the case of draft picks, you know that immediately after you draft the player. And you also know whether or not any given player is going to fit into your chosen scheme and playbook. And even then, that last bit, the developing young players, has only really become relevant in Madden in the last console generation or so, with the introduction of the new player experience system. I will grant that the preseason is not very popular with NFL viewers, or with the players, or with the players union. I would be willing to bet that most Madden users don't care much for playing the preseason, and probably skip it in their franchises. 
This is partly because most users probably don't think the preseason is meaningful football and don't see much value in playing it. It's probably also due in large part to the fact that Madden has historically failed to provide any mechanics or systems to make the preseason worth playing. But I personally think that the preseason is an underrated part of the current generation of Madden games, and also a part of the game that more users should be playing. And if you've already seen my video on the preseason being my favorite part of Madden, then you probably know where I'm going with this. One of, if not the, biggest successes of the modern incarnation of Madden's franchise mode is that it has actually introduced mechanics and systems that have made the preseason more interesting and meaningful, at least with regard to developing young players. The biggest new mechanic, which was introduced in 2016 or 2017, is the practice squad. In older Maddens, when it came time to cut down to 53 players, those cut players would just disappear into the free agency pool, where they would stagnate and never develop. Another big change is the move from stat-based end-of-season ratings progressions towards a more RPG-like experience and level-up mechanic. Players gain experience from practicing and from playing in games, and breakout performances can grant large, immediate attribute ratings boosts. Giving a rookie or practice squad player lots of extra reps in the preseason can actually be a very good way to give him experience and potentially level up some of his skills. Even if he won't end up in your 53-man roster right now, he can be stashed on the practice squad for a couple of years until he does level up enough that he is a viable starter or backup. And even if he never pans out, giving him a couple of extra points to his overall rating will increase his trade value if you decide to dump him for a better player or some extra late-round draft picks. The last new design element that makes preseason more worthwhile is that some players in modern Madden have hidden development traits, which require the player to play a certain number of snaps in a live game before the trade is unlocked. This is the one and only place in which a characteristic of a player is hidden to the user unless you play the player on the field. And you have to play that player quite a bit. You don't just put him in for one quarter of one preseason game and suddenly know how good he is. He'll have to see plenty of playing time in the regular season too. This means that playing a lower rated player over a slightly higher rated player might actually be beneficial because it unlocks that lower rated player's hidden dev trait sooner and you might find that he'll gain more experience and level up faster than the higher ranked player to the point that he might actually become better. And the preseason provides a perfect opportunity to get some extra reps for such players and to unlock those hidden dev traits a little bit sooner. Madden 23 also introduced player tags. These don't have much of an impact on player talent evaluation, but they do give the user something else to consider when building a roster, and they do have the potential to give some value to certain players beyond just their overall ratings. Personally, I found that the mentor tag, in particular, is very valuable. I will often sign low-rated veteran mentors as backups behind my younger developmental players and draft picks. These design elements of preseason give the user more judgment calls to make and encourage a little bit of experimentation and creative play calling. I wish that Madden would take these ideas a step further and extend them to the entire season and over multiple seasons. And I wish that the CPU would be programmed to have to play its own reserve players in order to figure out how good they actually are. And EA, Tiburon, if you're not going to program the CPU to sub deeper into its own roster for preseason games, then at least give us users the ability to alter the CPU's depth chart in preseason games, so that I can actually play my third and fourth string backups against the CPU's third and fourth string backups, instead of having to play my deep reserves against the CPU's second stringers and even some starters. It's just, it's not fair. Come on. <sighs> But even though the preseason is much more valuable in modern Madden as a developmental tool for improving young players, it still does not serve those other key attributes of the preseason in that it is not a necessary part of evaluating player talent. And this problem carries over into the regular season and beyond. So maybe if you aren't just simming the whole preseason, you might play around with some deep reserves in the preseason. Maybe. 
but once you get into the regular season, those players are either cut or they're stashed on the practice squad, and you don't ever see them on the field again. The rest of your lineup at that point is pretty much set in stone. And unless some young players had a breakout preseason and gained a few points to his overall rating to put his overall at or above the guy at the bottom of your depth chart, your starting lineup after the end of preseason probably looks almost exactly the way it did at the start of preseason. It all just comes down to the numbers, and those numbers just aren't going to change that much in just three games, especially if the younger reserves are only seeing one quarter or less of action in each of those three games. Although it's certainly possible to get a bust in the draft, there is just no concept of a bust when it comes to free agent or trade acquisitions. You're not going to find out that a particular trade or free agent pickup is simply not working out. You're not going to acquire a player thinking that he's an 80 overall, only to find out from preseason and training camp that he's really only a low 70 something who just doesn't fit your scheme or play calling style. You know exactly what you are getting all the time. Oh, and while we're on the topic of the draft in Madden, I do have a nagging pet peeve that I want to get off my chest, and I don't know if I'm going to have a better opportunity to do it anytime soon. When Madden projects when in the draft a rookie will be drafted, it lists the round number for rounds 1 through 4, but then for rounds 5 through 7, it changes it to say day 3. Why not just say rounds 5 through 7 and stay consistent with the language that you used for the other rounds? In fact, Madden does not split up the draft into multiple days the way that the real NFL draft is structured. In Madden, the draft goes through all seven rounds without stopping. No division of days. I could easily see a casual football fan or Madden player who doesn't pay much attention to football in the offseason not really understanding what day three even means. Does that mean round three? So either change the projection to say rounds 5 through 7, or split your draft into multiple days. Maybe Madden's draft should stop after the first round. It could then give a summary of the first round's picks, maybe some fancy analysis show to talk about which teams made good picks and make some new projections about which teams might draft which players in the second round. It could then give the user a little bit extra time to look through the remaining draft prospects, reorganize your draft board, and maybe do some wheeling and dealing to trade picks around. Then it could start round two, go through round three and four, and then stop again for another draft summary, some more analysis, another set of projections for which teams might draft which players in round five, and another opportunity to look at who's left and reorganize your draft board. This way, the phrase day three would actually be meaningful within the video game. Anyway, sorry about that little mini rant. Uh, what were we talking about again? Uh, oh yeah. Madden also doesn't really have any concept of a player simply not being suited to a particular role or position. Yes, modern Madden does have this concept of scheme fits, but these don't really affect the player's play on the field. Basically, each scheme has a set of preferred attribute ratings, and if that set of attributes happens to be, on average, higher than the sets of ratings preferred by the other schemes, then the player is considered a fit for that scheme. His overall might show up as a little bit higher for teams that run a scheme for which the player fits, so different teams might actually see slightly different overall ratings for any given player. But even so, you still know if a player is a scheme fit because the ratings are all known, publicly available values, and the roster screen shows you that the player is a scheme fit. You're not going to trade for a particular player thinking that he'll fit your scheme, only to find out later during the actual season that he just doesn't. It doesn't help that the players in Madden have generally lacked any kind of personality. I've also covered this topic a bit in my video on the humanity of NCAA football's recruiting. Madden 23 tried to rectify this somewhat by giving all players a set of motivations. But these only go so far. They only affect how much money a player will be willing to accept from a given team in order to sign in free agency. Oh, and there's also this personality rating, but I have no friggin' clue what this does in-game. As far as I can tell, being with a team that doesn't fit a player's desires does not reduce that player's morale or his performance on the field in any way. Players don't hold out for a better contract or complain about their role with the team during press conferences, and they certainly do not become locker room distractions that negatively impact the team's on-field performance. 
there's also absolutely no pressure on coaches to play or bench particular players. If Mitch Trubisky throws a third interception in the first half of a game, nobody is going to start calling for Trubisky to get benched and for Kenny Pickett to come out and start the second half. If a backup like Bailey Zappi plays well in relief of a struggling or injured starter like Mac Jones, there won't be a QB controversy among the fan base, media, or within the locker room. There's also no pressure from fans, players, or the bean-counting management to play an overpaid veteran in order to get your money's worth from him, even if he isn't the best player on the depth chart. As Brett Coleman points out in his video about the 2020 Cardinals defense turning itself around in the middle of the year, Defensive coordinator Vance Joseph may have felt pressured to play an overpaid veteran, Terrell Suggs, in the twilight of his career, even though he simply didn't fit very well into the team's defensive scheme. The coach was forced to adjust his depth chart around Terrell Suggs early in the season, which meant putting Hassan Reddick in a position that was outside of his skill set. For free. Reddick is not meant to play inside linebacker. He never developed the instincts for it to make it work. I the defense struggled until Suggs was cut late in the season, which finally allowed the coaches to rearrange their depth chart and put the other players into the right positions, and suddenly, the defense got kind of good. But it changed everything in Arizona. With Sizzle permanently out of the lineup, Coach Joseph was finally able to play his guys in their best and most impactful positions. Jones moved to Will Linebacker immediately where he got five sacks and a whopping 15 pressures over the next three games. Reddick was finally able to play Sam Linebacker, which is a... If Terrell Suggs isn't the highest rated player on your depth chart, then he's not going to be at the top of the depth chart. It does not matter how much the player is getting paid or how popular he is among the fan base or how storied his career might have been. And if he does have the highest ratings on the depth chart, then he is going to start, and he is going to play better than any of the other players who might be behind him on the depth chart. In Madden, because of the fact that all ratings and scheme fits are publicly known absolutes, there are never any situations in which a team might put a player in a position or role that he isn't really suited for. We know what every player's rating is for every depth chart position and for every scheme. So there is no question of whether a particular linebacker might be better as an inside linebacker or as an outside linebacker or as an edge rusher, let alone whether he's best suited to play Mike, Will, Sam, Ted, Jack, or any of the other variations of linebacker types which depend on the team's defensive scheme. Similarly, there's no question whether an offensive lineman is best suited to play interior line or at tackle, or whether he's better as a right tackle or a left tackle. Heck, because quarterbacks can see the entire field, there isn't even much, if any, difference between the blindside offensive tackle and the, um, is there a word or label for the tackle that is opposite the blindside? Would it be the sight side tackle? Play side tackle? Whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is that teams in Madden don't have to move players around to try to find their ideal positions on the field, not even for young, developing players. I mean, how often do we see real NFL teams move offensive linemen around to different positions on the line? Case in point, in 2021, the Bears drafted Tevin Jenkins in the second round as a standout right tackle out of college. He played his first NFL games at left tackle after returning from a preseason training camp injury that required back surgery, but after inconsistent play at left tackle, he was moved the following season to right guard. He's been playing right guard ever since, and he's been playing pretty well in that position. That's probably where he's going to stay. We also saw the 2022 Raiders bench quarterback Derek Carr for Jared Stidham after they were eliminated from playoff contention. Presumably because they knew they didn't want to re-sign Carr already, and they wanted to find out if Stidham was going to be a viable starting quarterback until they found a long-term replacement. They eventually cut Carr altogether, but they apparently didn't like Stidham either because they also cut him and signed Jimmy Garoppolo, who the 49ers decided not to re-sign. Teams don't do this in Madden. Teams in Madden don't bench starters late in a lame duck season in order to test out backups and see if they are viable replacements. Because the ratings of all players is known. There's no chance that a 60 overall player, like Stidham, is going to perform better than an 80 overall player, like Carr. So the CPU will never bench a starter in favor of a lower rated player, no matter how bad the starter's play is, no matter how young or untested the lower rated player might be, 
and no matter how dismal their season is going with the current lineup. A human user might do something like this in order to give the backups experience and hopefully level up their ratings a little bit, but there's no expectation that replacing the starter for a lower-rated backup will somehow turn the season around. And there's actually no reason why the CPU teams couldn't be programmed to play backups in a lame duck season in the hopes of improving their ratings too. That could at least create some of these realistic and interesting scenarios. But Tebron doesn't bother, and the CPU teams just stick with their starters until the bitter end. These sorts of things simply do not happen in Madden. Knowing exactly how well a player will perform means there is virtually no ludic pressure to ever make roster moves during the season. If you've ever been playing a franchise in Madden and the trade deadline comes and goes without you even noticing, this is a big reason why. And this wasn't always the case either. Madden 06 had a franchise mode that was built entirely around the idea of off-field drama. It included a storyline central feature that included newspapers and the Tony Bruno radio show that would routinely highlight locker room drama, contract negotiations, trade rumors, and so forth. Honestly, I don't think that Madden 06's storyline central was nearly as robust as some people seem to remember it being, but it at least made the league feel more alive, and it forced Tiburon to program CPU teams to occasionally make roster moves just so that the storyline central would have something to talk about. Even the NCAA football games of that same era included off-field drama, such as academic eligibility issues and off-field discipline problems, such as players not showing up to practices, which could lead to players getting suspensions or probation. Some people over the years have suggested that the NFL and the NCAA might respectively be the reasons for the disappearance of those features from those respective games as both organizations have pressured EA to remove some features because they painted the leagues in a negative light. I mean, this is, after all, a corporation that managed to get away with not paying taxes for decades on the grounds that it was supposedly a non-profit. And it also only gave a tiny fraction of the proceeds from its overpriced novelty charity merchandise to the actual charity, it hid its knowledge of the severity of concussions, and it has inconsistent application of its own rules and disciplinary procedures. And it has certainly done a plethora of other sleazy, controversial things over the decades. So I certainly would not put it past the NFL to give out an exclusive license to only one game publisher for the purposes of more closely controlling the content of said game and make sure it doesn't present the NFL in bad light. That does, in fact, seem very on-brand to the NFL, at least to me. But then again, it could also simply have been a matter of the code and assets being lost when Tiburon transitioned the games from the PS2 and Xbox engines to the PS3 and Xbox 360 engines. Or the features could simply have been removed due to a change in creative vision within the studio. I don't work at EA. I have no insight knowledge of the situation. I can't tell you which story is true. Maybe it's a combination of all of the above. All I can say is that these features used to be in the game, so there is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be possible to implement from a practical, technical, and gameplay design standpoint. There's no reason why modern, more advanced consoles and PCs should not be able to handle these sorts of concepts. In fact, not only would such mechanics be possible with modern consoles, but they would actually fit in very well with the other existing features that are currently in Madden's franchise. The current game already has morale ratings for players. It has the aforementioned experience and leveling system with the possibility of breakout performances. It has these little press conference mini games. It has the concept of scheme fits and specialized roles. And it has these new tag and motivation features that could be used to help define a player's personality and priorities. And it has make-believe social media feeds and news headlines that are supposed to highlight the drama going on around the league. But all of these features feel limp and weightless if the user even notices that they're there, because they rarely, if ever, create truly dynamic scenarios, let alone interesting or difficult decisions for the user to make. So now we get to the meat of the episode. How do I think EA can fix these weaknesses of Madden's franchise mode? Well, in terms of creating some off-field drama, all they need to do is look back at what the game was doing 20 years ago. 
And the other thing would be to take some of these ideas like hidden dev traits, the practice squad, the in-season scouting, player motivations, player tags, and extend them to their logical conclusions. I've actually already pitched an idea for a solution to this very problem in my earlier video about why I actually like the preseason in Madden, but I'm not going to go through the entire thing again here, I'm just going to summarize the idea for you. Basically, I believe that the actual ratings of players, especially young players, should be hidden to the user, and should be slowly revealed through practice, training camp, and playtime in actual games. Basically, take the in-season recruiting mechanic, which obfuscates incoming rookies' actual ratings prior to the draft, and extend that out to each prospect's first few years in the league as well. In fact, Madden has already experimented a little with this very idea all the way back in 2011. Madden 12 hid rookie ratings in the preseason, and a few ratings would be revealed each week of preseason. This mechanic kind of sucked back in 2011 for a variety of reasons, but I think it would work way better now, since it pairs better with the features that have been introduced into Madden in the intervening years. So one problem is that Madden 12 completely revealed all of the player's ratings automatically over the course of the preseason, regardless of whether the player played a single down in the preseason or not. So it wasn't based on that particular player actually playing or acquiring game experience and only the ratings of rookies were hidden. By the end of preseason, all of the ratings of every player in the league was known. Further, Madden 12 did not include any sort of practice squad, and it also enforced the NFL's old rule for mandatory cut days. Each week of preseason, the teams in Madden 12 had to cut players to meet a roster size limit that shrunk each week of preseason. This meant that very low-rated players would be cut without even having an opportunity to play in the preseason at all. And without a practice squad to move them onto, those cut players would just vanish into the shaft of the free agent pool, where they would never progress and probably never get signed by a team ever again. That rule has since changed, and the real NFL teams can now carry 90 players into the final preseason game, and modern Madden games now have an actual practice squad, although modern Madden games still lock us at 75 players instead of the actual limit of 90 players, but whatever, that's a different issue. This mechanic from Madden 12 is another textbook example of yet another problem that I've discussed in past videos, which is EA's tendency to cut underdeveloped features from Madden, instead of actually trying to iterate on those features. However, as I've also mentioned in a recent video, the past years of Madden have actually seen a little bit of a reversal of this trend, as recent Madden games have taken relatively successful mulligans on features that were introduced several years prior, but didn't initially work out for one reason or another. So maybe it's time for Modern Madden to take another stab at that old Madden 12 idea. A revision of this mechanic could be extended out to be a season-long process, such that the player ratings are revealed gradually over time through weekly practice reps and by game reps. Practicing the player and playing him during the preseason should reveal his ratings sooner than just practicing and playing starters. Further, those players can play in all three preseason games since we no longer have to meet arbitrary cut quotas each week of the preseason. And if any player's full ratings are not revealed by the end of the preseason, we can stash him on the practice squad and continue to evaluate and develop him over coming years, instead of having to just cut him. Perhaps part of the pre-game preparation for preseason games should include deciding how many possessions or quarters to let the starters play. How long you decide to leave them should be based on how young and inexperienced your team is. If you have lots of veterans with known skill sets, maybe they only need one drive to shake the rust off. If you have a bunch of younger players, rookies, and free agents, then you may need to leave them in for multiple drives to evaluate how they play in your system. Once the starters have been subbed out, CPU teams should also substitute deeper into their depth chart as the preseason game progresses. The CPU should focus on giving more playtime to younger players with less experience and whose skill ratings are still mostly unknown. In real life, of course, determining who to play, when to play them, and how long to play them in the preseason is a much more complicated calculus. Star veterans don't see much, if any, preseason action at all. A player like Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers, A, has a very well-known skill set, 
and B, makes too goddamn much money and is too valuable to the team to risk a major injury in a meaningless preseason game. So a player like that may be pulled out of a preseason game early or just not play at all, even if the rest of the starters stay on the field longer. So yeah, the system that I just proposed may not accommodate that very well, but I'm also not really asking it to because that is admittedly kind of a lot. But it's at least better than the system that Madden uses now, in which starters play for the first half or first quarter, and then the second string plays the rest of the game with no substitutions deeper into the depth chart at all. The important thing here is to make sure that rookies and deep reserves see some playing time for evaluation and developmental purposes. If it means that superstar veterans play a little bit longer than they would in real life, whatever, that's okay, because we still get to see the deeper reserves later in the game. Besides, Madden's current preseason substitution logic already has starters playing for longer than they typically do in a real-life preseason game, so it's a wash in that regard anyway. How and when ratings are actually revealed could also be open to different design decisions by EA. Maybe ratings are slowly revealed automatically based on how much the player plays and practices. Or maybe each time a player gains enough experience that he levels up, some of his true ratings are revealed as well. And maybe there could be a training camp before the preseason that allows each team to automatically reveal certain ratings for players. And there could also be coach abilities that could allow teams to reveal some extra ratings as well. This could also open the door to a playable training camp feature. Perhaps after the off-season training camp, each player is given a camp grade for each player, which indicates how well that player performed at camp. Players who perform very well at camp may get an experience boost when they get to the preseason and regular season. This creates a mechanical incentive to give that player more playing time, even if it is just a rotational role. A backup may have a really good camp and earn himself a starting spot, but it should also be possible that a veteran starter who has a mediocre camp could still be good enough to retain his starting job compared to the lower rated backups. If the CPU is given a choice between a veteran with completely known ratings and a younger player who might be slightly better, but his exact ratings are unknown, CPU teams should favor the established veteran as the starter going into this preseason, but give the younger player plenty of rotational reps. Eventually, as the younger player levels up and his ratings are revealed, he can be moved into the starting slot. So in a case like the 2022 Pittsburgh Steelers, with mediocre Mitch Trubisky and inexperienced Kenny Pickett as the QB options, Pickett might have been better overall, but the Steelers should still err towards starting Trubisky until Pickett proves himself in actual play, or, you know, Trubisky blows it. Furthermore, I believe that player regression should also be tweaked, so that when an older player's ratings start to regress, those regressed ratings should once again become hidden. This would mean that signing a veteran free agent or re-signing a veteran whose contract has expired might be a bit more of a gamble. Teams simply won't know for sure if that player is still as good as he used to be. This would also add more incentive to test out veteran free agent or trade acquisitions in the preseason in order to make sure that you didn't pay all that money for a veteran bust. And finding out in the middle of the season that our veterans' ratings have regressed more than you thought might create more of a pressure or incentive to trade that player. Maybe there can even be ways for the player's current team to reveal the regressed ratings prior to the rest of the league finding out about them, so that you can potentially try to sucker another team into trading for your regressed veteran, while that other team still thinks that veteran has some gas left in the tank. Or maybe revealing that a player's ratings have regressed could become grounds for restructuring that player's contract so that you can free up some cap space to sign and then to start grooming a younger replacement. This could be especially viable if the veteran has a mentor tag. Even if he physically isn't capable of playing his position at a high level, he could still be worth keeping on your roster for a couple years in order to teach younger players and progress them faster. Heck, maybe every player, regardless of how old they are, should have a handful of their ratings become hidden during the offseason so that they have to be reevaluated. Even players in their prime could have a few ratings here and there, you know, that could possibly re have regressed or improved, but they're not shown immediately to the player, so you have to play them in preseason or training camp 
or get regular season reps in order to find out if they've actually gotten better or gotten worse. This could also affect a player's scheme fits. If you don't know his exact ratings, you might also not know if he's still a good scheme fit. For example, if an edge rusher has lost a few steps in speed, maybe he's not a great edge rusher anymore. In that case, maybe you can try playing him, playing him at an interior position, or you can try trading him to another team who's willing to take a gamble on whether that player will fit into their scheme or not. Furthermore, I would propose that teams could have one additional pro scout to go along with your college scouts, who could be sent to other teams' practices in order to evaluate those teams' practice squad players and reveal a few of their ratings. Or maybe that pro scout could be used to evaluate free agents before you actually sign them. Maybe the free agent signing process could actually be made into a multi-step process in which you pick a set of players in order to hold private workouts prior to picking which one of those to actually sign. And that private workout may unlock some of their hidden ratings if they have any. This could be useful for signing veteran players who may have had some of their ratings hidden by regression. All of these pieces are in place for Madden's current franchise mode to create this level of intrigue and drama. All it really takes is for there to be some ambiguity about how good a player actually is. I can't think of any better example of regression turning a star player into a complete mystery box than the case of Russell Wilson's performance with Denver in the 2022 season. I was super high on the Broncos after the Russell Wilson trade. Their situation kind of reminded me a little bit of the Matt Stafford trade to the Rams the year prior, and we all saw how that turned out. After the Wilson to Broncos trade, I ran out to the sportsbook as quickly as I could, and I put money on the Broncos making the playoffs and going to the Super Bowl. Boy, was I wrong. And so were the Broncos. How much of Russell Wilson's poor 2022 performance was the result of bad coaching, and how much of it was regression on the part of Russell Wilson? It's really hard to say. I mean, we know that there was bad coaching. Well, they've got three timeouts. Yeah. You'd think they'd want a little time to be able to think this over. Nathaniel Hackett was fired midway through the season. I mean, heck, he was so far out of his element that he had to hire an assistant coach just to tell him when to call timeouts. The fans are doing all they can to help out this Denver offense. They're helping by counting down the play clock so there's no more delay of games. Fans trying to help out this offense, Andrew. Where were they in the first half? That's a good one, Michael. I haven't heard that one before. But Russell's play was also not very good. Was this just a bad year, or was it a sign of permanent regression? Has Russell Wilson lost a step and isn't the QB that we all thought he was? Will Russell Wilson be good next year with a hopefully more competent coach, assuming that he doesn't retire? Who knows? I sure as hell don't know. Do the Broncos know? Probably not. But if this were Madden, everybody would know exactly how good he's going to be next year. Because we can just look at his ratings. Now, before we wrap this episode up, I also want to contrast Madden's approach to giving absolute information to the user against how some other football games have handled similar kinds of ideas. We'll start by looking at the indie football sim, Axis Football. Axis Football does have numeric ratings for all player attributes on a 100-point scale, just like Madden does. However, you can only see these numbers by going into the roster editor, which, you know, you're not supposed to be doing in an active franchise. These numbers are not visible to the user, ever, in the franchise mode. Instead, Axis Football gives letter grades for each player's attribute ratings, just like in school, you know, A, A-, B+, B, and so forth, all the way down to F. These letter grades encompass a small range of possible numeric values under the hood. Instead of simply telling you that the player has an 88 speed rating, Axis Football says he has a B+, but that B+, could be anywhere from 87 to 89. Thus, two or more players could have the same or very similar overall ratings, say they all have a B+, 
but they could still be separated by several points on that 100 point scale, and the user doesn't necessarily know which player is actually the better player overall even though the difference between them is actually honestly fairly marginal. But this does create interesting decisions for the user to make, and it opens up new approaches for team building and management. Both players being a B plus means that neither is the clear objective starter over the other, and their role on the team is going to depend on user strategy. I can pick the one whose specific ratings best suit my playstyle and play calling. If I run a lot of zone running schemes, maybe I start the faster running back because he's going to have an easier time beating defenders to the outside for big runs. If I run a power scheme, which to be fair isn't really supported very well by Axis, but let's just say for the sake of argument, I run a power scheme, maybe I would prefer a stronger running back who is going to be able to run over defenders in the gap. And I can also use these players in rotational roles. Axis doesn't have the convenient depth chart positions for passing down backs or short yardage backs like what Madden has. So I would have to manually sub in a player for that specific situation if I wanted to run such a committee backfield. If my power back is the main back, but the defense is loading the box for a goal line stand, maybe I sub in the quicker back to try to get him to the outside on a toss. I mean, he's also a B plus. He's just as good, right? Just a little bit faster and not quite as strong. Or maybe I sub in the more agile back with a better catch rating for third down passing situations. Again, he's just as good as the main back, a B+, just maybe a little bit faster and with better hands. Yes, Madden does allow the user to do all of these things as well, but the decisions feel more automatic, mechanical, because Madden gives these absolute ratings. The starter is just the player with the highest overall rating for the given depth chart position. In Axis football, the more ambiguous rating system forces me to make more judgment calls. Similarly, when the offseason comes around, I have a much more difficult decision to make in Axis football. Both my running backs are a B plus. Neither is a clear starter. So who do I re-sign and who do I trade away or let go into free agency? I don't have an absolute number telling me that one back is one or two points better than the other. I have to make a judgment call. That judgment call will likely come down to which of the two players played better for me. Or maybe it comes down to their age, or again, it could come down to playstyle. Maybe I want the faster back, maybe I want the back that can catch better. It's, again, a judgment call. And then there's Backbreaker. Backbreaker, sadly, did not turn out to be the revolutionary football game that it promised to be and that we were all hoping it would be, but it did have some clever ideas. In fact, I've already referred to Backbreaker once or twice in previous episodes of this series, Backbreaker's career mode was pretty bare bones, but it did have one interesting idea that's relevant to this discussion. Backbreaker had a mechanic called form. Basically, players could have a good or a bad week of practice, which would carry over and translate into improved or nerfed performance, respectively, in that week's upcoming matchup. You still knew what each player's true ratings were, but you had to make a judgment call on whether to stick with your regular higher-rated starter who maybe had an average or bad week of practice and whose actual on-field play might not live up to their true ratings, versus giving more playing time to a younger, lower-rated backup who maybe had a really good week of practice and who is therefore going to play better than his ratings suggest. Maybe Madden could adapt this idea or something very similar and add it to its own weekly practice mechanic. How well a player performs in weekly practice could depend on a variety of factors, such as a consistency rating or a trait, how many reps they are given in practice, their morale, progressive fatigue levels, certain personality traits or motivations, and so forth. And this, again, is why I recommend to people that they play a variety of different football games, including some of these indie games or lower-budget games that might not actually be very good or which might be outright bad. Even a bad game can still have good ideas in it. And if nobody plays those games and nobody acknowledges that, yeah, that idea is pretty good, then the better games aren't going to know that they could adapt such an idea for their own games and make their games better. So please, play Axis Football. Play Maximum Football. Play Legend Bowl. Play Retro Bowl. They've all got different approaches to various different ideas and concepts. 
and some of them are pretty good and could potentially inspire future Madden games. But that'll only be the case if we all recognize that those are good ideas and we put pressure on EA to implement them. Well, this was a big topic, and this episode ended up being a doozy to put together. I was hoping to have this done before January, and probably about 20 minutes shorter, but I ended up letting it simmer while I finished up other projects that I had been putting off for a long time, and in that time, I kept adding and adding to the script. I really hope everyone enjoyed it, and I really hope that some football game developer somewhere, whether it's EA, 2K, Axis, Modus, Super Pixel, or someone else, takes this idea seriously and tries it out. It's a damn shame that it was partially implemented in Madden 12 and then just abandoned and forgotten. I had actually been initially planning on doing uh, standalone episodes each for the preseason and the draft, but I really feel like this just about covers everything I wanted to say about those two topics, at least the important stuff. So uh, who knows how long the preseason will be around, so it might end up being a moot topic anyway. So for now, I think I want to stick to football strategy for the next episode or two. Specifically, I think I might talk about the lackluster efforts that Madden and other football games have taken towards game planning and in-game strategy. So stay tuned, please subscribe, like, share, comment, and check out the Patreon page, and, and as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>